Hello everyone, I greet in the name of God Almighty. My name is Apostle Newton Silas and today we have a very interesting video to react to. In fact, it's actually a second segment of a former British um, diplomat, Charles Eaton Lee, who converts to Islam and then also sharing his 50 year of experience in Islam and then also the life of Prophet Muhammad. I believe that this is going to be a very interesting one for some of you who have watched the first um, segment. This happens to be the second um, segment of his story and I want to encourage you to stay from the beginning to the end for us to learn from some of the things you'll be pointed out irrespective of whether you're a Christian or a Muslim. So if today happens to be the first time of you checking out my channel, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and follow me on my Facebook and Instagram. And if you have any video you want me to react to, don't forget to drop it at the comment section and I'm going to check it out. So guys, before we get on to the video, I'm a theologian and I make this video not to discredit anyone's religion. This is basically for educational purposes and I believe that at the end of this video, we all are going to learn from this. So let's get down to this video and check this out. Welcome back to Matters of Faith. We're in Wimbledon, London with Sheikh Hassan uh, Geiton. Many people call him Sheikh Hassan. Because Gaiton um, has actually also worked in the London Central Mosque for over 20 years, editing a, a quarterly called mm -hmm. the Islamic Quarterly. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what was your experience with the British Muslim community and how did it go together with Sufism? It's not known to be a Sufi mosque, the London Central Mosque. It was, I think, extremely interesting because it was very easy for Europeans who adopt a Sufi path to distance themselves from the Ummah, that is, from the community of Islam. Now that, I think, is wrong. We may find the majority of our fellow Muslims <laughs> misbehave a lot and can be very tiresome. Nonetheless, we are part of the same body, and that is something fundamentally. And therefore, I think it was very useful for me to have this close contact with um, ordinary practicing Muslims. Because obviously working in a mosque, um, these were on the whole people who practiced their religion. And a huge variety, obviously. I had my office there, I worked three days a week, I just carried on. And um, I came to the conclusion the common English saying that people may prefer the devil they know to any stranger, that that is rather an Arab habit. They knew me, they knew me then very well. Um, it was useful for them to have an Englishman on the staff, after as a kind of go-between between, between um, them and the host community. And um, well, they knew me, so you know. And any inquiries about Sufism, they would refer to you. That's right, yes, yes. They were glad of a chance to <laughs> shift that onto my shoulders <laughs> and so on. Yeah, if we look back into time, um, you, you were beautifully describing in your book, uh, Islam and the Destiny of Man, how Islam spread like a wildfire. Um, you know, within a hundred years it reached from one empire to the next, from China yes, to yes. Africa and so on. Um, what was it? I mean, if we look at, you know, the state of affairs nowadays, surely it couldn't have spread if it was like that. So what was it at the time that, you know, made it spread so much? Well, of course, um, the prophet is reported to have said that his generation was the best. And then the next, and then the next, and next, and next, and next. And obviously going downhill. Yeah. <laughs> We've gone downhill. <laughs> but um, <coughs> it was largely by example. Now, it's a myth that Islam was spread by, con by conquest, by the sword. It wasn't, except in one sense, that, of course, the New Muslims, the New Age, were so full of faith, so exuberant, so rushing out, wanting to conquer, and so on, 
they did conquer many territories. Now, they, they, they never forced anybody to embrace their religion. On the contrary, many of them felt today it's our religion, we don't want to share it. But nonetheless, some, obviously, people who wanted the best jobs and so on and so forth, saw an interest in becoming Muslim. So, from that minor point of view, um, conquest aided the spread. But in the main, and this can be attributed to Sufi traders, particularly in South India, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, these men were simple traders, in many cases, or in most cases, in fact, Sufis, going, going about their business peacefully. And the local people, the indigenous people, who on the whole lived in some disorder, saw these good men and thought, well, these are the first really good people we've met. Mm. Why is that? Of they're Muslim. And so you had these massive conversions, and that does apply particularly to, as I say, Malaysia and Indonesia. And um, it's only much later that you had extremist forms of Islam. How did Sufism um, attract people? You said you were you know, almost converted through Su Sufism, you know, your faith was strengthened. Um, oh, yes. All these people you just mentioned were inspired by Sufi traders. What is it about um, Sufism that inspires people? Um, two things, I suppose. One, obviously, is that this is a very effective means of approaching God, of becoming as aware of Him as we are capable of doing. Secondly, Sufism has always been a path of peace, charity, mercy, concern for others. And these are immensely attractive qualities and alas, rather rare qualities in the world today. Just uh, for clarity, um, Sufism is solely related to Islam, or yes. where did it originate? No, it originates <coughs> in Islam. Um, people confuse their terms, and this is something that always annoys me a bit, because it's, as Orwell taught us, it's very important to get the right words applied to the right realities. Of course, mysticism of one sort or another, one shape or another, has existed for as long as one knows. I mean, you know, way, 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 way back. But it takes a different colouring, different emphasis, according to the cultural and the religious context in which it is found. And it therefore had inevitably to arise within Islam, and it did so with an Islamic colouring. To understand this better, can you define the nature of God in Islam? Um, well, you see, this is always difficult because um, we know that he cannot be defined. That is the basic principle. Having said this, we have to have some idea in our heads of what we mean by God. And according to a very important hadith, a very important hadith could see, an inspired saying of the Prophet, God has said uh, roughly, I hope I'm getting the words right, I am in the image that my servant has of me. And this can only be an aspect of the divine mercy. So, we ha in order to worship, you've got to have some idea of who or what you're worshipping. You can't worship the totally un unknown. And at the same time, in the Quran, you have these 99 
beautiful names of God, revealed names. And these obviously can be explored almost indefinitely to show the divine qualities. But because they cover the whole spectrum, they also inevitably cover contradictions. And in Sufism, uh, those divine names are sometimes um, almost stepping stones to, to God or uh, are they used somehow um, they to acquire, imbibe the qualities of God. Yes, oh yes. Um, so how can Sufism lead to God in a sense? Um, remember that uh, Sufism is divided into various turuk or tariqas, as they're mm -hmm. called. And um, each derives its strength from some great sheikh, some great teacher. And in each case, there are slightly, slightly different techniques. It doesn't really matter much. Um, some, for example, will invoke La ilaha illallah, the declaration of the divine unity. Others will simply invoke the name of God, Allah. Others will call upon particular divine names, Ya Latif, Ya Rahman, Ya Karim, and so on. Um, these are unimportant differences because they could not just be one way of doing things. There could not just be one technique, I don't like the word technique, one manner of approaching God. There have to be countless ones. And indeed, it is said often enough that there is a way for each individual and that no two individual ways are quite identical. There are as many ways of paths to God as their hearts. Um, exactly. Almost. Exactly. But one thing they all have in common is that they are, they bring about transformation somehow. Can well, you explain this. It's difficult to talk about transformation because um, God alone can read hearts. This is one of the most fundamental things. It's something that always made it difficult for me personally to judge people. If I don't, I can't see into their hearts. And um, you cannot know, basically, if somebody has really been transformed or not. It may be that in an extreme crisis, you can see by the way they deal with the crisis, if they are different to the person that they were previously. But that is why in Islam, testing trials are so important. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Christian. Okay, it was wonderful seeing you. Bless thank you, you for inviting us to your okay. home and inspiring us with so many special insights. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Matters of Faith from Gay Eaton's home. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye bye. Oh, that's a very interesting um, video. Listening to Charles Eating, of course, um, giving us more insight, you understand, about um, Islam, the spread of Islam, and then also its practice, and then some of the things that people perceive, you understand, about um, Islam. But one thing I tend to learn about um, Eating is while he was giving his story, and the kind of life he was living even before he uh, was converted uh, to Islam. He made us understand that he was born in Switzerland and then after the World War II, from there he was commissioned into the army. And then after that, he, that's when he started beginning to work um, with the great um, Britain. And then after that, before he finally converted to um, Islam. So one thing I want, or my take, you understand, in this video concerning that is 
when you look at in a sense his life even before he was commissioned into the army and then the kind of life he was living of course you could see him in a sense on the horse and you know he was that kind of a person that wanted to you know have fun you know you are young you want to explore and all those things but then one beautiful thing about god is he normally used people that he didn't see them you understand to be okay to spread you understand his own um message and god does not um um, discriminate okay he can be able to use anyone to be able to deliver his um, message irrespective of the kind of lifestyle you understand you live being it that probably you are someone who um, who should I say maybe probably you are a drunkard or you take alcohol or you smoke or you're an arm robber or you are a harlot or whatever you understand you think you understand you are god can still use you for his um purpose so irrespective of whatever kind of life he was living at the end of the day what happened he end up becoming in a sense someone who spread islam and not just even about spreading islam but he was actually becoming what an author and wrote so many books in a sense about um islam it is only god who can be able to make some of these things in a sense to happen he also talks about um transformation and one beautiful thing you understand about transformation is he said that it is very difficult for you to be able to judge the minds of human and the reason being is because it is only God who can be able to read the mind. And then since it's only God that will be able to read the mind, then he is the one that can be able to like tell to whether, you understand, someone is being transformed or not. And that's why you cannot be able to, uh, to judge anyone. The reason being is because you do not know in his heart what he's actually communicating with his maker to whether the person is actually um, seeking innocent for forgiveness for God to show him mercy. So at that point in time, how do you become innocent a judge? She says you can't be able to know some of these things. A very interesting one. But the last point I want to also point out is the life of the traders that were able to help to spread Islam in Europe malaysia indonesia and the rest of it if you look at it in a sense critically some of these traders you should ask yourself what was their kind of innocent personalities their character and how they be able to, to engage in understand with people those are the some of the things that they were doing that make people feels like oh these people for what in a sense they do i could see peace in it i could see sincerity in it i think that their religion in a sense may be true so who is their God? And then from there, people would tend to want to find out. And then from there, they tend to want to discover God. And that's why irrespective of where you find yourself, right? At least, like the Bible says that word, you should live a life that when people see, they are going to glorify their Father. That's God in heaven. So what that is expected of you and me is wherever we find ourselves or whatever we do, let there be sincerity in it, right? Let there be what? Peace in it. Whatever you do, you understand, it should be able to be something that when people see, they will now ask that, who is the God that these people are actually worshipping or this person is worshipping? And then from there, it will attract them what? to the kingdom of God. This is how our life should be. Sometimes, that's why I used to say that, what, let's not get engulfed by whatever that is happening here on this very earth because we are going to leave everything. So what we should be much more concerned about is what? The heavenly life, the life we are going to live after here. That's what that we should be much more concerned about. And that's why what we should not what, get engulfed by those things things because those people were able to live right they were able to like see justice in them see clarity in them see them live in peace right see some of these good qualities in them and then that attract them to what to follow islam so ask yourself the kind of life you are living if people see can he be able to lead them to their maker in heaven their creator you know sometimes you could be spreading you understand the word necessarily not actually by engaging people or by saying it but sometimes it's how you practice it people are there people are observing people are watching you you may not know so the question is the kind of life i am living the kind of life you are living can it draw anyone to its creator you should ask yourself this question i should also ask myself these very um questions of course this interview was a little bit long of course there are a lot of things that i may not point it out but then i want some of you who are also watching with me to also uh, see your contribution at the comment section let's all learn from one another and i also want you to also notify at the comment section where you are actually watching me 
from and god is gonna bless you as you do so so this is the end of my video if you like my reaction if you like share and subscribe and if you have any video you want me to react to don't forget to drop it at the comment section and i'm going to check it out so guys you remain blessed and i see you in my next video bye bye